Hello and uh, welcome to the second episode of Richmond Desert Island Discs. Our castaway today is Peter Feldschreiber. How are you, Peter? Thanks very much. <laughs> very happy to be here. Great. Uh, <laughs> Peter has been a member of uh, Richmond Synagogue for close to 50 years. Uh, but obviously you, you didn't grow up in Richmond and you grew up in Notting Hill and Cricklewood. Would you like to just perhaps just tell me a little bit about about your upbringing in both Notting Hill and in Crickerwood and what your parents were like at that time? I can't remember very much about Notting Hill Gate. I was born in 1943 uh, and initially my father was, um, was, was, was away in the, in the war in Europe. So I didn't grow up see my father, I think till I was four or five years old. And uh, I grew up with my mother in a single room in, not in Stanley Crescent in Notting Hill. I can't remember very much about it. Uh, it was a single room. I, um, there are other tenants in the, in, in the block, in the house. Um, and uh, all I can remember is very dark green walls. And I've hated the color green ever since then. Uh, I think I was evacuated to Leicestershire um, in my in the first couple of years, but I can't remember anything about that. Um, in 1946-47, we moved to a house in Heber Road in Cricklewood, and that's really where I my, I spent my formative years, I suspect. Mm. But uh, again, I can't remember very much except for moving in a, in a, in the lorry with all our possessions from Notting Hill to Cricklewood, and that was the first time I'd been right. in, a, in a car, in a motor, in a motor vehicle. Right. As long as it wasn't dark green. As long as it wasn't <laughs> dark green. <laughs> uh, did you experience any um, anti-Semitism growing up? No, the, uh, not that I can remember. Um, I do remember him being called Yid and Jew boy on my way to primary school sometimes, but I never saw that as anti-Semitism really. Um, I, in retrospect, the only real experience of anti-Semitism was when I passed the 11, pro, 11 plus and um, I was initially allocated to Haberdasher School, which was also in Cricklewood at the time. But we then got a letter before I entered saying, awfully sorry, you can't come here. We've fulfilled our Jewish quota. Mm -hmm. um, now that was in 1953, 54. Um, and I didn't register at that time just how discriminatory that was. That would obviously be illegal now, but uh, yeah. things were different in those days. It would be more of an outcry today, I think. In those days, it was probably just, you just kind of took it as, as standard. Exactly. <clears throat> so, I mean, speaking of, speaking of your secondary school, um, I believe you had quite a prestigious uh, cohort there. Um, can you tell us a, bit, a little bit about your experience in, in your secondary, the secondary school that you went to? Um, well, if, I don't know which one you went to. We, well, I went to Christ College Finchley, um, which was popularly known in those days as Joshki Yeshiva, because <laughs> there was a very positive Jewish quota there, and uh, there were many North London families who sent their kids there. Um, Jonathan Sachs was several years below me, but he was very active uh, organizing kosher meals at Kinloss down the road. Um, we had infamous rather than infamous people who became celebrities like Charlie Saatchi. Um, I haven't seen Charlie for many, many years, but we were friends in those days and we used to do cross country runs together. Um, we were part of the couple of two or three boys who managed to get the bus up Bittersea Hill in Mill Lane and we um, we cheated and uh, my one m memory with Charlie was we won the cross-country running prize after we'd been cheats on that particular cross-country it's not something I'm particularly proud of but, um, but you, got, you got a lift but I got a lift for it, yes <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So I'm just moving on to your first first choice of music to take with you um, onto a desert island. Um, your first choice um, is the Ode to Joy from Beethoven's Mighty Ninth Symphony. Could you just share why, why that particular piece of music speaks to you? This harks back to my father. 
um, he was passionate about Beethoven. None of, none of the family were musicians. My mother wasn't a musician, nor was my father, but he used to love Beethoven. And this is my earliest recollection, was the uh, the choral part of the, of the Ninth Symphony, because it espoused all the... Uh, all the things that we should be very proud of, the, the idea of brotherhood of man and respect and love for all communities and all members of communities. And this is a very great music, uh, great piece of music to, to represent that. Okay, that's great. We'll, we'll play Ode to Joy now. Thank you. 
So in your very early career, um, you went into medical research and pharmaceuticals. Uh, could you just say how you got into that and what were your early influences in, in your decision to go into that particular field? Well, without bragging, I was, I was reasonably bright at school and uh, my father wanted me to follow his profession. He'd been a lawyer in Vienna um, before the war. Uh, he was a very brilliant man and had been a teacher and uh, in private practice and was training to be a judge at, uh, at the University of Vienna. Um, when the Nazis came in, uh, he was beaten up, had to scrub the streets and was imprisoned. But he managed to get out of prison, out of Dachau, uh, escaped to this country. And then after the war, he was so badly damaged by what had happened to him that he never re regained his profession. He never requalified in English, but he always wanted me to, um, to follow in his footsteps. And um, because he hadn't qualified and had done a number of charity jobs, we lived in very constrained circumstances. Uh, we were, to be honest, we were poor. And the example I had of being a lawyer was living from week to week on very, very low income. So I had big arguments with him and I didn't want to do law because I just didn't see where it would lead. Um, I was interested in science. So I went into the, uh, into the science part of the school. In those days, you either did science or arts. So I just concentrated on physics, chemistry and maths and biology. And, uh, and I ended up in, in science and, uh, and medicine. Um, um, and I never, never thought about law uh, for many years. And my, my principal career always was, and still to some extent is, in, in medical science. Hmm. You didn't want to become a, a, a full doctor or surgeon or anything like that? Well, well I, I, I did in that I, I, when I qualified in medicine, I did postgraduate training in anesthesia and intensive care. But, um, and the scientific basis of, of, of that. But um, I, I realised well into my postgraduate training that I just didn't have the, the kind of personality 
that you you had to be to be a, um, a full time anaesthetist intensivist, mainly because I am a pretty anxious person, and uh, the stresses of that job are are immense. So after uh, uh, six seven years on on the verge of uh, applying for um, senior jobs, uh, I decided to to change specialisms and uh, decided to go into general practice, uh, which I did for a, a year or so as a trainee. Uh, in those days, you could just qualify in general practice after a year's practice. Uh, but again, that didn't really satisfy me. I didn't enjoy it that much. Maybe there were other issues as well. So I was a, a sort of slightly lost soul, I suppose. So I decided to change that and go back into science and I did academic pharmacology and therapeutics and then joined the drug industry where I had a happy career for many years uh, in big pharma. Um, and then I moved from big pharma and became a civil servant in the regulatory authority with the Committee on Safety of Medicines. Mm -hmm. And that was really my, my medical career up to uh, retirement age or what should have been retirement age. <laughs> well. Uh uh, where on this journey did you did you meet your wife Lynn, uh, and how did you meet her? I met Lynn, <coughs> thank God, um, in my mid thirties, uh, and uh, I was a junior doctor on the house in uh, St Thomas's Hospital. I, I was senior house officer at Thomas's, and uh, I was introduced to Lynn. She came down to a wedding of a friend of mine to which I had been invited. Lynn's mother was a great friend of the groom's mother. And I keep saying that it was an arranged marriage in that I was, uh, I was booked to sit next to Lynn at the, at the wedding tea. Um, and uh, I was re really, I really fancied Lynn. And uh, I tried very hard to chat her up, as one did in those days. And all she said to me after three hours, my name is Lynn, not Linda. And that was the uh, a signal that, that was either the end or the beginning of the relationship. So I phoned her um, the week after and invited myself up to Manchester. And we got married some uh, nine months later. Wow. Mother tough. <laughs> you got there in the end. You got there in the no, end. I got there in the end. Yes. <laughs> um, did, I mean, you've seen, we mentioned that you've been living in Richmond for many years now. Um, do you enjoy? It? I mean, how do you enjoy the community in Richmond? What do you like about it? The Richmond Jewish community and the Richmond secular community. Yeah, both both I enjoy immensely. The shul is a very it's a very warm and embracing environment, and it actually means a lot to me. I've never been particularly active administratively or um, as a member, but I enjoy going there. And it, there's a feeling of um, solace, quiet, comfort, and community uh, on a shutter's morning, which means, uh, means a lot to me during the vicissitudes of life to have uh, some time off during the week to sit and meditate in that particularly warm, embracing environment. I can't describe it more than that, but I think mm. it's a, a very, very comforting place. Mm. As and far the, as the community yeah, goes, I've made some very, very dear friends on both sides, both the religious side, both the Jewish side, but also in Richmond as a, as a general community. It's a very, very inviting and embracing place. Um, so, yes, your second choice of music is Mahler. Um, so what is about Mahler and this particular symphony that you've chosen uh, as your second choice? Um, it's the tone of the music. Mahler was a Jewish, uh, one of those rare Jewish composers who, in his music, could foresee what was happening in society at large. And I think that he predicted um, the, uh, the Second World War and the Shoah, the anti-Semitism and the discrimination against Jews. I think that's embedded in, particularly in this piece, um, which is why I'm so connected to it. Okay, we're going to play an excerpt from the first movement of the Symphony No. 4, Mahler Symphony No. 4, um, now.
Okay, so you took a bit of a, a U-turn in your career later on. Um, can you perhaps give us a little bit of a background as why you decided to switch and, um, yeah. and how did your family take to this? Well, my family thought I was crazy. Everybody thought I was crazy. It was a mush of gas. Uh, I decided in my late 50s, I think, I was 57, 58, that my father might have been right all along. And I was very interested in, in law and ethics. Uh, I was interested in the ethics of medicine. I was interested in the legal aspects of medicine. And I had a profound respect for the rule of law. So I, I, I went to bit crackers and decided to do a, um, a law degree part-time. It all started off because a deep, dear friend of mine who used to be uh, an old Bailey judge phoned me up one, uh, one Saturday morning and said that the roof had fallen in on his chambers to hair court in, uh, in, uh, in a temple and he needed some friends to go and rescue the books because rainwater was pouring down. So I agreed. It was the first time I'd been to Middle Temple. He took me round and I, I fell in love with the place. I fell, fell in love particularly with Middle Temple Hall. And uh, I said, how do you join this club? And he explained that there are various formalities to go through, like learning law. So I, um, I decided to do a part-time law degree. Um, I got my degree, God knows how. And then I decided to do the bar finals. I had this image of becoming a, a sort of a rump hole of the Bailey um, and uh, decided to try and qualify as a lawyer. All my friends said that I was absolutely crazy. Other very senior lawyers of me, of my uh, friends of mine took me for lunch in, uh, in Middle Temple, I remember, uh, just as I was about to do my bar finals and said I was absolutely crazy. Uh, I would never qualify. I was hurting myself. I was hurting the family. What I was doing was ludicrous and one of them who was a, a, a very well respected high court judge said look you're not going to pass finals you certainly won't uh, you won't qualify there's no way you'll ever get pupillage if you get pupillage there's no way you'll get tenancy in any chambers and at the end of it even if you qualify uh, fully as a barrister no solicitor in their right mind will ever, ever instruct you and besides that uh, to do anything in this career, you'll have to get yourself in the leading in the directory of leading lawyers in chambers, and you'll have to publish a book on um, medicines regulations, and that's not going to happen to you. Stop it now. So about four years later, I published the first in, uh, first edition of um, the law and regulation of medicines, which I'm not ashamed to advertise by Oxford University Press. And um, he wrote back and um, Michael did the, did said in the foreword that it was a, a, a very useful textbook. And uh, since I published the second edition of that book a week ago, uh, he now says, maybe I should have done law after all. Mm -hmm. So there we are. Um, but I'm now in practice, uh, to my amazement, I have got uh, an international practice predominantly advisory practice with clients, mainly in the United States and the Far East. And, uh, and here I am. Mm. Um, I haven't re retired yet. I'm just going quietly eccentric in my own way. But there we are. Yeah. What, what, how old were you when, when you qualified? I was 60, 60, 61. Uh, and yeah. that was some 20 years ago. So there's no regrets. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't. Others, others can tell that. I haven't <laughs> yet. No, I'm having a whale of a time. Fantastic. Um, so, your final piece that, that you've chosen is um, a Chazanut version of Kol Nidre, uh, famous, uh, of course, that we sing on on Yom Kippur evening. Um, and in many ways, it's the original version because that's you know that that that's where Kol Nidre originally uh, came from. Could you just explain what what this particular piece means to you? Yes, this goes back a long way. The one abiding memory I have of my Jewishness when I was young is Warm Lake Shul had a wonderful cousin, cousin Fagenbloom, and uh, we had a wonderful choir of which I was 
temporarily a member of. I think it was wonderful, but I do remember particularly the crowded shul on Colnidre night and Cousin Fagenbloom uh, espousing this particular piece. So that's one of my fundamental memories that, uh, that mean a, a very great deal to me. Here's Cantor Gideon Zellemeyer with the Shah Shemaim Choir. Oh, mm-hmm. 
finally, I just want to going to ask you, um, really thinking about uh, the next generation, obviously you've got uh, children, grandchildren, but also uh, no doubt many other people who've influenced from the younger generation. What message do you have um, for the younger generation? What, what can they take, particularly from your life or, but, or but things that you've learned that you feel are, you particularly want to uh, pass on the message to them? I don't want to be pompous, but as a second generation Holocaust survivor, um, those memories, those reminiscences, such as my parents used to talk about them, which wasn't very much, they didn't talk very much about it, but the damage it did to them and the, the lasting um, vicarious memories mean a lot to me in that we should learn just how dangerous racism um, is, how pernicious it is. And as members of the younger Jewish generation, we have to realize that we mustn't discriminate, that we must be ecumenical, but all the, whole, all the time we must recognize that anti-Semitism is not something that we should be paranoid about all the time, but we should recognize it and fight it wherever we see it, wherever see it, wherever we see it happening. Um, but we should we should be able to mix totally in society as a whole, which is a very basic Jewish concept anyway. Thank you, thank you for Peter for talking to us today. It's been really really kind for you to give us your time. Uh, this has been Rabbi Meir Schindler, and you've been listening to Richmond Desert Island Discs. Thank you.